Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second episode of How to Build Character. This is an educational stream series from RPHQ in which we are going to teach you and uh, anyone you want to share this with how to make characters in different tabletop RPGs. If you didn't see the first video, I will have that exported to YouTube soon. Uh, we learned about making clerics in D&D 5e, which is D&D 5th edition. Today, we are going to be learning how to make characters in Call of Cthulhu. And it's a lot different. If you've never played any tabletop game, uh, this is... Um, bit more complicated when it comes to making characters, but we've got your back. We're here to help. We're going to show you how it's done. And the company that makes it has these awesome character sheets that fill in for you part of, part of the information. So we are going to go ahead and get started. I am Celestia, and here with me, who's actually teaching how to do this, I'm just the conduit from w through which he will do so, is one of our PHQ's members and council members, Javeen. Hello, everybody. I am going to switch over to the cam just for a minute. And I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, Call of Cthulhu, what all we have. Hi, everybody. Uh, one of the differences between Call of Cthulhu and Dungeons and Dragons is there's not a million different books for everybody involved. <laughs> Instead, you have one book. It is the Keeper's Rule Book. Uh, it's a big old boy. It's very thick. And this is a combination DMG and PHB. So this is both the Dungeon Master Guide and the Player Handbook as well. Of course, there are lots of other books that you can get, um, just like in D&D. There's all these optional books. However, most of the ones that come with Call of Cthulhu are extra campaigns or little one-shot stories. If you go to a convention and see a Chaosium, which is the company that makes this uh, booth, there are just stacks and stacks and stacks of books because it is a very big setting with a lot of freedom and they just have a lot of really awesome stuff. Um, the people who make it have actually multiple settings so you can do modern times, 1920s, we'll talk about more of that later. But you can get so many awesome books and settings that are already made for this. Um, you can also get a few other things that I'll show before we actually start. Um, you can get, if you need help, whether you're a game master or your player and you need some help filling out your character sheet, they have all these awesome card decks that you can get that uh, include NPCs or they have uh, artifacts and weapons and event decks, things that will happen during gameplay. And probably uh, one of the coolest ones is this Phobia uh, deck that you can draw things from. And of course they have lots of little props like these super awesome coins that you can get. I've uh, been in multiple games now that incorporate those and they're really rad. So that's just a little bit of the stuff that you can get, but just like with Dungeons and Dragons, if you were here for the last one or watched the first video, we told you your number one priority is that player handbook, and that is the same thing with this situation. The uh, Keeper's Rulebook is the most important thing you need. Uh, it'll teach you all about the game, and uh, as far as I know, when Javine and I bought our copies of the Rulebook at Gen Con, we got a free digital copy as well. So if you buy this, I think you also get a digital copy. So it's super handy. That way you have it no matter where you want to go. Stick it on a flash drive. can open it up anywhere on your phone, on your iPad. It's fantastic. So just like before, this is all you need. And we're here to help you with the rest. So I'm just going to go ahead and swap back to the PowerPoint only. And we're going to tell you a little bit about this. And I'm going to turn it over to my dear friend Javine to teach you how to build character in Call of Cthulhu. All right. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Sari. Uh, yes, I do want to preface. Um, first of all, thank you all for tuning in to listen, uh, to uh, share your interest in Call of Cthulhu. And as Sari said before, 
Yes, this game is very different from normal Dungeons and Dragons. It is not a dungeon crawler game where your characters go off to fight goblins or dragons. More so, this is heavily uh, investigation. So you are trying to solve puzzles or pieces um, that are going to lead to something grand or something beyond this world that your investigators will need to solve. So we can definitely start by going to our uh, character sheet. And as Sarah also said uh, during the introduction, there are numerous amounts of character sheets um, that are available for download. Pretty much all of them, I believe, are fillable in PDF format. So you don't have to worry about writing anything by hand. Uh, you just type in your numbers. Uh, that we will show you how to do here in just a moment. And then everything is uh, purely auto-calculated. So it definitely saves a lot of headache. Uh, and again, some of these can be from, you can have your campaign in the 1920s, which is uh, usually where you find most of the Lovecraftian stories, where it's in Arkham, Massachusetts. But you can have it in Space Age era, or you can have it in medieval times. No matter what era you want to play your Call of Cthulhu setting in, there is always a character sheet for that. And it is extremely versatile, and you can use this for any setting. You can swap, you can switch, you can do whatever you would like. So starting off, when you are designing your character, you kind of want to have a, much like in D&D, &D, uh, where you kind of have a class you want to play or a class in mind, you kind of want to have what's called an occupation in mind. What is your character's overall job going to be in this world, no matter where they are at? So if we look at the top box here, this is the 1920s character sheet. We have the name of the character, the player, the occupation, the age, which actually plays a important role in some of these characteristics. Uh, are they male or female? the residence where they're living now, and then their birth place, where were they born from. So starting off here, uh, I believe that in the 1920s, there's a lot of gangs, a lot of criminals. So I think it might be easy to uh, put in a criminal into this campaign. And in this Call of Cthulhu handbook, there are a lot of different attributes associated with this particular occupation. So in occupation, we don't need to worry about the name too much right now. We can just put a uh, criminal uh, under that line. So, for example, perhaps they are either a gang member or they could even be someone who's trying to own a speakeasy. Perhaps this is in, uh, you're in an area heavily influenced by prohibition. Uh, obviously, no alcohol is served. So you would be classified as a criminal by the police. Maybe not by everyone, though, as you're trying to uh, basically export this alcohol to the public. Uh, for an age, you can choose anywhere between the age of 15 and the age of 90. And again, depending on where you're at within this range will have different effects on your characteristics, which we will get to here in a bit. But as a just a random age number, let's pick 28. Perhaps this character was uh, has sort of maybe an establishment, uh, maybe got started in this trade, um, not too old that this person might have, you know, a lot of knowledge in it, but is definitely old enough that they can definitely get started. Uh, and let's say that this character is female, which does not have a significant change on characteristics. Now, looking at the birth residence and birthplace, whether or not, or how this comes into effect with the uh, character with the session depends on the DM. Now, in the one Call of Cthulhu that I ran last year, it uh, took place in New Orleans in the 1920s during Prohibition. The players had characters from all over, from Ireland, from Germany, uh, from West Virginia. So I kind of incorporated all that all of that sort of geography, all that area into my session, bringing in lore from all those places to try to make it interesting for the players to investigate this story or this campaign. But for now, let's go with something simple. So with residents, let's say they are from Boston, Massachusetts. 
that, that is currently where they are living. That is where their speakeasy is located. And so far, that is where their story would begin if the campaign or when the campaign starts. Now, with a birthplace, does not have to be the same as the residence, though it could be. Uh, for this, let's say that their birthplace was from Augusta, Augusta, Georgia. Wow, well, I can speak. Augusta, Georgia. And there could be numerous reasons why they moved. In this case, perhaps their father left them the speakeasy in Massachusetts, and in order to inherit this uh, business, they need to move all the way to Massachusetts in order to do what they are currently doing now. So once we have this all figured out, uh, you can definitely put a name for the player. Um, we're just going to go ahead and use a name from one of the players from the last session, uh, Hazel. The best player from the last session. The best player from the last <laughs> session, Hazel, who went on a complete, not did not go on a complete murder rampage at the end. <laughs> definitely did her part. Definitely did something. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So once we have all that information to fill in, or filled in, we move over to the box on the right-hand side. And this is the characteristics. Now, a lot of these will seem very familiar, like with Dungeons & Dragons. You have strength, con, size, which is not apparent, dex, appearance, education, intelligence, and power. And... Unlike Call of Cthulhu, you really do sort of have to roll dice in order to get these numbers. Now, the die, which I really love about this tabletop RPG, you're going to be mostly using percentile die, which is really nice because whether it be Iron Kingdoms, Dungeons & Dragons, uh, Vampire the Masquerade, any other tabletop RPG really does not utilize percentile dice this much. But Call of Cthulhu is you're primarily using these dice, and it's really good that these are kind of shown in a really good light here in this game. So that is something that's very different and something that I definitely appreciate. So when you're coming up with your skills, or when you're rolling for your skills, each one has a formula, uh, formula for what you're going to be uh, rolling for. So when you are rolling, say, for strength, which is going to be your, uh, how strong you are, you know, how physically able are you to lift, say, heavy objects. So you will, for this moment, you're just going to be rolling uh, a d6. Most of the rolls for percentile dice is going to be rolled after this. Uh, you will roll 3d6 and multiply by 5 to get your strength characteristic. So... Once we do that, I just plugged it into my virtual uh, dice roll and got a 60 for your strength, or for this character's strength. And this is where these automatic character uh, sheets, uh, where they have the auto calculations, this is where they really come in handy because there's a whole lot of um, math to set up. <laughs> but once you get those big numbers, like the 60 for the strength, then it goes ahead and fills in these other two boxes, which are the half and then, uh, what is it, a fifth? Yeah. So it, and those are important later on, um, but it goes ahead and fills all those in for you uh, because those are going to come into play later. Yep, and that is correct. And I will kind of go into that a little bit more as we uh, get further down the line into the skills and uh, abilities that your investigator will have. All right, so for deck, we are going to, uh, well, let's, let's go down the line to constitution. So for constitution, it's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be 3d6 multiplied by five, uh, which in this case, I got 60 again. Uh, for size, it's actually gonna be a little bit different. It's gonna be 2d6 plus six, and then you multiply that by five. And you can find these all in the handbook. Uh, in the Call of Cthulhu, it is going to be chapter three, uh, starting from page 30. If you do happen to have 
the Call of Cthulhu handbook or the Keeper book with you at this uh, as you're watching this video. So for that, as I plug that in, it's going to be 55 for the size. So pretty average. And I'll kind of go over and define what these numbers uh, mean as we go through. Uh, next will be dexterity, which is going to be 3d6 times 5. Uh, again, got 60 for this one. I'm getting a lot of 60s for these. Appearance is going to be 3d6 times 5, which is, I got 85, which is very high number. This person is going to be very good looking. So, so pretty. Very pretty. <laughs> For education, it's going to be roll. It's going to be two uh, d six plus six, and again multiplying that by five. Uh, in this case, got seventy. So pretty smart. Uh, definitely had a lot of uh, life lessons uh, during this character's life, during Hazel's life. And it's important to note that education and intellect are not the same. In Correct. This yes. So education is going to be more. What did you learn throughout your life? such as life skills versus intellect, which is going to be more um, learning through books, learning through uh, actual courses or instruction. All right, so speaking of intelligence, uh, I apologize, it is the reverse, as I said that like that's not right so yeah education is going to be formal versus intelligence which is going to be what did you learn as you were going through life so uh intelligence is going to be 2d6 plus 6 and then multiply that by 5 which for this one i got 85 so hazel can definitely remember a lot of information and can apply this knowledge on top of being very educated uh maybe having gone to a school reading up on this, but can apply that to practical situations. And then for the last one, for power, it's going to be a 3d6 times 5. And for this, I have a power of 30. So we have all this filled out. And what this means for this character, as you look at these, you say, okay, you know, I see a bunch of 60s, you know, 30, 70, what does this all have to do with anything? This will indicate basically how do the NPCs perceive your character. So having, having a strength of 60 is above average for this character. Uh, they are fairly strong, maybe more athletic uh, than uh, other people that they may be coming across. Again, much smarter, uh, both the education and the intelligence are pretty high numbers, which means they are definitely above average. They're definitely well, uh, well learned and can remember a lot of information, can analyze a lot of information fairly quickly. Uh, and with the appearance, again, is very, very high. They look maybe very attractive or at least can definitely use their looks to gain more trust in some of the NPCs, some of their characters. Uh, their size maybe about average maybe about like five feet or so so not particularly tall um, definitely not short but using all of this it's basically saying that hazel is definitely above average for most um for most attributes uh for this uh investigator So now we go down to the current HP, which again, if you look at the uh, box where it says hit points on the left-hand side, you can see that's already auto-calculated uh, the maximum HP that your investigator uh, will have. Actually, before that, which is going to be uh, basically your comp plus your size, um, and then dividing by 10, and you get the lowest number. Now, before we continue, I uh, to remember that I said that your age plays a part in the characteristics that your investigator has. So, you have an age of 28 here, 
which in the rule book, um, as I look at the page number here, as I have the digital in front of me. So on page 32, it has a list of the different ages and what you will need to do in order to, uh, in order to change some of these attributes or what you would need to do uh, for your character as you make their age. So because Hazel is 28 in this world or in this campaign, you will need to make what's called an improvement check for the education. Now this is where your percentile dice comes in handy. So as you roll your percentile dice, you need to get a score above a 70. And if you do so, then you can roll a 1d10 to determine how many points get added onto your score. So as I roll my virtual percentile dice, I got a 72, which means I beat my educational score in this main box here. And as I roll my 1d10, I have three. So Hazel's character or Hazel's education will go up by three points. And you'll notice that as you are entering in this data, or as you're entering this number, the boxes on the right hand side will indeed change to again match your half value as well as your one fifth value. So going further down from the hit box, uh, so we have 11, which is, again, your size plus your constitution divided by 10, and then taking the lowest number. Your luck is going to be, like most of the other tributes, 3d6 times 5. And in this case, it's going to get a total of 40, as I rolled. And what you can do use luck for is, say, uh, when we'll get into this a little bit more, um, but say you failed a roll, you can use luck points to bump that roll up to at least meet the uh, DC check, or meeting the total that is needed to surpass this particular challenge. And you can always get luck back at the end of the session, um, and in most cases, you can actually exceed your starting total uh, luck value because you can constantly roll, no matter what you've done in the campaign, everyone gets to roll to improve their luck. It comes in very handy. Yeah. Now for sanity, it's going to be equal to your power. And sanity is going to be determined based on how well your character can handle seeing these otherworldly eldritch-like beings. Say, they come into a room and she sees a bunch of star spawn just standing around the room, which is also very weird. Um, but then she would need to roll a sanity check. Uh, and this would be a D100 or a percentile die. And in order to pass a check, unlike an improvement check, she needs to roll under her main stat here. So if I was to roll a on the virtual die... She got a 29, so just barely passed her sanity check, which means that she doesn't take any sort of mental damage. Uh, she doesn't get any sort of temporary insanity, but she should probably leave the room immediately. That's the great so, thing about Call of Cthulhu is most of the time you do want to roll low. So if you have a history of just rolling ones all the time, you're going to love this game. <laughs> yes, definitely rolling, uh, yes, definitely rolling zeros and ones and twos and... Yeah, it's great. It's great for this game. All right, so then we have on to uh, magic points, which is a fifth, or yeah, it is a fifth of the power stat. Uh, if you look up there, you see 15 and 6. So your magic points will be 6 total. And even though I'm not going to discuss this too much, spells, unlike in Dungeons & Dragons, spells are not something you want to use a lot because they do have a cost to them, not just magic points, but something else. So they can cost sanity. They can cost intelligence. They, you know, the spell might drain you of your constitution and it could be permanent. You know, a lot of these spells can be variable, uh, can be modified by both the keeper and the players upon uh, discussion with the group. So though you had magic points, 
you don't want to start casting, you know, say fireball, you know, multiple times in a round because you might be going insane and be casting fireball on your allies, and that's not going to be a good thing. Uh, and say you were going in a more space age um, uh, campaign, you could uh, brew a space brew, uh, space mead, which allows you to survive in the vacuum of space, but also costs so much of your intelligence and sanity, it is not even funny, so it's almost not worth it to make it unless you have a lot to spare. So again, 30 is going to be plugged into your sanity box, and then six will be plugged into your magic points box. And I will pause for a moment if there are any questions as I go down to the second half of our character sheet, or further down on our character sheet. anyone has any questions as we go through this feel free to drop them in the chat uh, this is like i said going to go up on youtube later so the more questions we get the better that way we can answer those now so that when this is on youtube later people will get those verbally instead of uh, missing out on the chat itself uh, this next part is a little bit um tedious uh, when picking up all the skills and filling them in, it is something that takes a little bit of time. So we are going to be filling these in uh, a little bit faster because it is something that takes a while. We filled them in in advance so that it would not take as long because you're going to have a whole lot of skill points to allocate. So we're this part will go a little faster just as an explanation so that when people watch this later or people who are watching it live don't look at it and think oh my gosh they're going so fast <laughs> so we're going to stress to you how how to get the number of skill points you have to work with and how to uh, allocate those but we're not going to sit here and and do all that math <laughs> and, and all that adding and everything because it is a lot man you have a lot to work with in this and it, it seems like a lot until you really get in there but uh, it it would take a long time if we didn't do it in advance for you yes it is very <laughs> it is very time consuming i remember when people were when people were questioning me regarding you know how to uh you know what skills should i use what you know how many points do i have it is it is a lot um but again you know we're just cover this as efficiently as possible. So um, moving on to the investigator skills, we have picked again the occupation of criminal and each occupation has a very specific set of skills that is necessary for this investigator. In this case, we can choose one of four interpersonal skills, which is either charm, fast talk, intimidate or persuade, psychology, spot hidden, stealth, plus uh, four of any of the following, which is going to be either appraise, disguise, fighting, firearms, locksmith, mechanical repair, blah, mechanical repair, and sleight of hand. And this can all be found on page 40 of the Keeper's uh, Handbook. Now, again, we did sort of go through and do this uh, character sheet ahead of time so that we don't have to do the math, as Sari said uh, before. Uh, so just a couple things to point out here is that each investigator, depending on your occupation, has a credit rating. Uh, and this credit rating means how much cash do you have to spend per day and how many valuables do you have either on your person or in your home, wherever it may be, uh, that can be used as assets. So cash is, say, you have a credit rating of, say, 30. Uh, or in this case, for... Hazel's character sheet, she has a credit rating of 15. This would mean that she has uh, roughly about $30 to spend in one day, but if she wants to use more money, or if she wants to use more money per day than what she has in spending level, she will need to sell some of her possessions. Uh, she will need to go to her bank account, go to a trust person, uh, which can take more time than needed in order to buy, say, a fancy hat or, say, 
uh, a gun or something that she can use on this campaign. So something you definitely want to work out uh, with your uh, with your keeper as well as something you just want to make sure of um, as you're going through these skill sets. It's, so it's really important too to remember the time period that these are taking place in. Yes. As a yes. general rule, Call of Cthulhu will often take place in the 1920s, uh, which is, you know, not a great time economically. And uh, there are other campaigns that take place in the 40s, and then still others that are more like pop culture and take place in modern times or the future. Uh, a lot of the big ones take place in the 20s and then in the for in the 40s. So when we say that someone has a certain amount of money, some of these characters and investigators that you're going to run into, they may be real broke. <laughs> so that's yes, something they, to keep in mind. And also uh, on top of that kind of piggybacking off of that is I do want to also stress that having a low rating uh be it your characteristics or your skills does not necessarily make you a bad investigator everybody has a flaw you know maybe your character is super broke but does attribute or contribute a lot to the group's effort uh perhaps your appearance is very low but has high strength or high dexterity so don't be disheartened if you do make a roll and you know you get a really low roll on either your skill or if you don't put enough points into your skills or your characteristics because again you know, having a low number does not make you a bad investigator because everybody has a flaw, everybody has a strength, and that plays a huge part into the group effort of investigating. All right, so as we go through the skills, uh, as I mentioned before, I do have all of them uh, pointed out here on the pre-made uh, character sheet that we did before. Um, and in order to determine what or how many points you're going to be attributing, you have two groups of skill points. You have occupational skill points and you have hobby skill points. Occupational skill points are going to be primarily used just for the skills that were listed under this occupation and nothing else. And this is determined by... Again, this is a very occupational specific uh, formula. Your occupational skill points for a criminal is going to be education times two added to either your dexterity times two or your strength times two. In this case, looking at the character sheet, the strength and dexterity in the character's characteristics are the same. So it does not matter what you have um, no matter what you use, on top of your educational times two. So once you add that up, uh, you will have a total of uh, 260 points to spend. If I did my math right. And that's why we say that you've got a lot of points to spend. Yes, of course, you you're not going to be putting like one point into this, one point into that. Uh, you can see that They've got the percentages here, um, and Javine will explain that. But, I mean, obviously, the jump here, 20%, that's the base. That is what everyone's going to have that chooses that skill, and you're just buffing that number, right? Right. So, yeah, looking at the numbers in the parentheses next to the uh, name, so say if you look at accounting and it says 0.5%, uh, that's what everybody has. Every investigator has this uh, no matter what career they choose. But again, depending on what they choose, they can bump this number up, as Sari had stated. Um, but of course, 5%, remember, you have to roll low, and you have to roll under that. So rolling under 5%, probably not going to be li uh, likely. So if you have somebody who is really good at accounting, you might want them to take the charge on this, uh, depending, on what it, it, depending on what it may be. So... If we look at this character sheet here, uh, already got the points divvied out. So we're going to say that for one of our interpersonal skills, uh, the one that we chose was going to be charm. And in the box next to it, we have 45. In psychology, uh, towards the right-hand side, 
uh, we have 35. Uh, for spot hidden, we have 50. For stealth, we have 40. And then for sleight of hand, we have 60. So some of these seem pretty uh, seem pretty self-explanatory. I know that a lot of these, some of these are in, uh, or in Dungeons and Dragons, such as sleight of hand is, you know, how well can you pass something off to somebody without them noticing, things like that. Uh, and then you can also use, uh, and again, this is sort of what we came up with here, um, to total out our total occupational skills. You now have hobbyist skills, which is your intelligence times two. So 85 times two, which would be 170 points. And this can be used for anything. This is going to be used to bump up your skills that you currently have or to learn something new, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, you can also use this to bump up your credit rating, which you do have a standard on what you need. So for a criminal, you have to have a minimum of five points invested into uh, this particular occupation up to a max of 65. So you can start off pretty poor or you can end very rich, depending on how much you want to allocate to your money and to the investigator's financial status. So in this case, the credit rating was 15. We have an accounting of 20. An appraisal of 35. Disguise of 30, which which is, again, was one of the following, uh, as well as with sleight of hand, but again, we can use these hobbyists to put points into that. Uh, fighting Brawl, which is 25. Law, which is 37. Mechanical Repair, which is 40. Locksmith, which is 41. Listen, which is 50. Medicine, which is 10. Persuade, which is 30. And then science, which is 20. And again, looking at the right-hand side, all the tinier boxes, which is your half and fifth values, are auto-calculated as you increase your uh, changes. I think we also, on um, when we were going through this before, we did... It's we didn't do fighting brawl we did drive auto yeah i believe so so drive auto would be 40 in this case and we chose all of these we chose based off of the character herself uh, we thought since she is someone who's running a speakeasy she's gonna have to have knowledge of the brewing brewing equipment because she's not going to be able to just call anybody to work on that. So that's why we chose things like mechanical repair and locksmith. And we want to make sure that this is someone who knows what she's doing and knows how to secure her property, who knows how to fix everything if something goes wrong. That's why we chose all of these skills. Everything is based off of the character itself. And that's yes, what that you is should correct. keep in mind when you're making these characters. Yes. Yeah, don't, I mean, it's, yeah, definitely focus on things that your character would be doing, you know, whatever era you decide to play in. You know, if you are, a, you know, somebody's running a speakeasy or you're a policeman or you're a gang criminal, gang leader, whatever, what have you, uh, you definitely want to choose skills that would be associated with that position. And again, with the occupational skills kind of guides you on that path because um, it gives you a preset you know, list of things that your character should know or would know as they have gone through their life in this profession. Yeah, this game is very role-play heavy. It's not combat heavy. 
So if, if you're someone who's familiar with other tabletop games, but this one is new to you, it might be an adjustment because you're, you may be playing with people who are what we call min-maxers that are always trying to find the strongest, most powerful build because they're expecting combat, 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 and you won't have that in this. This is really great for people who are very invested in story and less in actual, they're not here to fight because you don't want to fight unless you absolutely have to in this world because it is scary. If you've read any HP Lovecraft, you know that these things are not things you want to tangle with. No, and usually if you get into a fight, you've done something very wrong. Um, yeah, fighting is something you want to avoid pretty much at all costs. I mean, fighting a couple of humans is one thing, but fighting something of an Eldric origin, uh, even be it just normal zombies coming up from the ground, can be very, very dangerous and can get very, very dangerous very, very quickly. So um, min-maxing in this game is definitely limited uh, because everyone does have a strength. And again, there is not much combat, or if there is, oh boy, <laughs> you're, you're in for the long haul. And you may not come out alive. All right, so I, moving on to com more combat, uh, Below the investigator skill set is we have weapons. Now, when I ran my game uh, last year, I made the horrible I made the horrible mistake of having someone start with an automatic weapon. This you do not want to do. I have learned from this. Um, it is very powerful. I would highly recommend that you don't do that unless you're running a different kind of campaign. Um, but here I will explain kind of what all these uh, titles mean. Uh, so starting on the left-hand side, we have a weapon and unarmed. This is just, you know, if you're just trying to punch somebody. Uh, a regular, which is 25, a hard 12, and an extreme 5. And what this means is the regular is, okay, you just have to roll under 25. So say, just like with a disguise or a charm, you just have to roll under that base number in order to succeed, no matter what it is. A hard is a, a hard roll or a hard, a hard success is can you roll under half that value? So if I roll under a 12, there's going to be benefits um, as a hard success. So something else will happen. Um, and then with an extreme roll, can you roll under a fifth of that value? That is a extreme success. And again, uh, you can have more damage applied, you can have a uh, bonus die applied to your uh, damage, whatever is in the book or the item at that time, or whatever the keeper decides to do uh, to help reward that player for rolling very, very, very low, which is very good in Call of Cthulhu. You have a damage of 1d3 plus db, which is your damage base, which I'll get into here in a second. Uh, your range, which if there's a dash, just means it's going to be melee range. You have to be in touch range in order to hit the person. Uh, with your attack, you can only make one attack per round. Uh, with ammo, well, unless you're some weird uh, android or abomination, you're probably not using ammo when you punch somebody. And again, with a dash on malfunction, because hopefully your fist does not malfunction uh, when you are using it. I guess it could, though, in this world. It could in this <laughs> world, and it is a very horrifying thing that would probably happen. Um, but say you had a handgun and you shot it, uh, there'd be a malfunction of, say, like 98 or 99. If you happen to somehow roll a 100 uh, or 99, in this case, your gun would break. You could spend time to repair it, but that's, that's just what malfunction means. Uh, you just make that roll at the end of every round. But again, starting off uh, with an automatic weapon with a malfunction of 99, has a very high damage, uh, very high regular base, uh, base number. I would not recommend that you do that if you're planning on being a keeper for this camp or for this game. So just keep that in mind. Now, on the right hand side, we do have the combat box, and this is the damage bonus, build, and dodge. The damage bonus is going to be based off of your size and of your uh, strength. So in this case, uh, there is a chart that is located. Uh, on page 35. And for Hazel, the size and strength 
is between 85 and 124. Which means that there is no damage bonus applied. So if she was to punch somebody, she would just be doing 1d3 damage. Uh, the build is going to be 0, which applies to if you want to grapple somebody, uh, if you want to try to take somebody down, you would use your build stat in order to be able to grapple them or do more damage to them. Uh, just something to keep in note is that you cannot grapple somebody that is uh, plus 2 to your build, or is higher than 2 uh, to your build. So in this case, if there's somebody that had a build of 2, which is going to be uh, a total of a size and, size and strength between 165 and 204, uh, she would not be able to do that because they are much bigger than her, much stronger than her, and she would need to find another way to take them down. Or say a build of six, uh, which is very, which is a monstrous, uh, monstrous being, you know, more than 50 feet tall. Don't think Hazel's going to be, you know, tackling them or wrestling them to the ground. And if she does, there's something else going on. That's what you think. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a very strong, uh, very strong investigator. Very strong scraggly investigator. All right. So, uh, with weapons and combat done, we go on to the now the backstory of the character, which I, I consider this to be the more fun. Because this is the way you can start to develop your investigator, depending on where they were born, uh, depending on where they're living. You can flesh out all the details here, um, which will definitely come into play uh, as the campaign goes through its sessions. So the first box we have is physical description. Uh, for Hazel, this is going to she's fairly tall, uh, definitely taller than the average person, uh, with black short hair and a beauty mark, uh, beauty mark on her cheek. This is something that people would identify her with as she speaks to some of these NPCs. For ideology and beliefs, uh, again, for Hazel, she believes that as she's running the speakeasy, you know, she doesn't believe that the government should control this or that the police can sh should control, you know, who gets alcohol and who doesn't. So she believes very firmly in the idea that everybody has a freedom of choice. For significant people, uh, in this case, her father had owned the speakeasy, uh, which was beneath a family general store in Massachusetts. Uh, he had put it there in defiance of the law, again, uh, inheriting uh, or giving Hazel this idea of everybody having a freedom of choice. And that whether he died or whether he moved away or whether he's still alive, she ended up inheriting this business. In the meaningful locations, which... I hate that we wrote this out, but uh, uh, it is, while I love it here in the north, I've got Georgia on my mind. Growing up from Georgia myself, I am not a necessarily big fan of the south, uh, or of Georgia in particular, at least from my area, but she is definitely a fan of Georgia. Um, I and live to torture him. Yes. Um, but again, you know, her home place is something that is meaningful to her. Um, and, you know, if something happens in Augusta, Georgia, you know, she may have to make that choice of, okay, do I stay here with a speakeasy or do I move back home? Uh, with treasured possessions, uh, she ended up having a locket that belonged to her mother, uh, who died giving birth to her. You know, this is something that she'd keep around her on her person at all times. You know, this is something that she'd keep away in a safe to make sure nobody would steal it. Uh, traits, you know, how does she interact with a lot of these NPCs? In this case, she is very stubborn and headstrong. Uh, she knows what she wants, and she wants to get. Uh, she works hard to get it. However, she is also uh, very sympathetic in the fact that she will also stand up for others if she sees them being pushed around by, you know, be it authorities, be it um, other speakeasy owners, you know, competition. She does she will end up standing up for others based on her beliefs. 
Now, with phobias and manias, whenever I do set up a Call of Cthulhu game, I do have the characters or the players give the investigator a phobia. I do require at least one phobia per investigator. Now, obviously, in the social situation, we want to make sure that everyone is still comfortable playing. So that is something that I have a discussion with with all my players. You know, because obviously if someone is, you know, really super scared of spiders in real life, well, you know, if we have a scene where there's a bunch of, you know, spiders crawling on their investigator, may not, you know, be the best thing to have during a session. Um, may make the player feel comfortable. So again, talk with the players. You know, I would talk with my players um, and see, you know, what would be a fun phobia that their character will have. In this case, with Hazel, her phobia is that she's not afraid of the dark, but being inside the dark makes her anxious. So while, you know, she's you know, not necessarily, not necessarily scared of going into this very dark room at the end of this hallway, uh, you know, there's some stress there because she might not know exactly what's in it, and being in there for too long can definitely drive a person crazy. Uh, with a mania, I do not require any investigator to have a mania. If they want to have a mania, that is perfectly fine. I will def you know, me myself as a keeper would definitely include it in a character backstory and have it play out somewhere in the campaign. Um, but I don't require it. However, for this example with Hazel, uh, she is obsessive when it comes to organizing documents, and she wants to make sure that all of her books are clean and that everything is in order. She's a very organized person. That's what sort of calms her down, sort of gets her away from the reality of what she's in right now. You know, say she was just in a stressful situation. She just ran away from the spawn. Uh, you know, maybe watch somebody die. And she goes back to her general store, speakeasy. You know, this is something that she would do to sort of calm herself down, to kind of reel her mind back um, into a place where she's not immediately in this uh, dangerous situation in reality. I just want to also point out, this is a horror RPG. Yes. <laughs> and that doesn't always come across when we're like looking at numbers and things like that. But that is what this overall is. It's And a lot of times in tabletops, they're set in these fantasy settings. They might have some scary moments. Um, but this is horror. I mean, that's how this is designed. And... Honestly, in any tabletop game you play in, I want to make sure it's very important that everyone knows, especially talking to new players, you should always let your game master or dungeon master know if you're uncomfortable. He made the comment that if someone is absolutely just has a debilitating fear of something, they're not going to include it. Most good game masters aren't going to torture their players they're going to take that into consideration. Just work with your DM. Let them know what makes you uncomfortable. Let them know if something traumatic has happened that you're like, I really don't want that to take place. And that's particularly important in this type of game from where it is a horror game. Um, one of our friends has a really great system that if anything ever happens while we're playing that makes us uncomfortable, we just send him a private message that just is we just send him the letter x and that tells him i need to stop what i'm doing the someone is uncomfortable for some reason we're going to move on we're not even going to address it we're just going to move on to something else and this is just your mid set mid episode psa to take other people's situations into consideration <laughs> so yes. if you're ever super uncomfortable you tell someone this is supposed to be fun. This is not supposed yes. to be traumatic. Correct. And even though this is horror, again, as you were saying, you know, we want to make sure we, we want to make sure, at least, you know, as a DM, I want to make sure that players are definitely having fun. And, you know, bringing, bringing up a fear, even though this is a horror game, you know, that might be, you know, affecting somebody else, again, not fun. And I know that even now as I'm running a campaign, you know, I have since adopted this X rule, and it is very beneficial. Um, and keeps things more in line. All right, so moving on to the next uh, section, we have Arcane Tomes, Spells, and Artifacts. Now, 
As I said further at the beginning of this video, uh, spells are very powerful and very costly. Um, even some of the more lower ranked spells can provide a huge edge in a situation. Which is why I generally do not allow players to start off with spells unless they come to talk to me and we discuss it over um, in detail. You know, why would you have this arcane tome? Why would you have these spells? And even then, I would put limitations uh, on this because of how, don't want to say necessarily game breaking, but you know, how powerful these can be. Uh, you just don't want to add spells if you're wanting to be a keeper for this game, if you're wanting to DM, you know, don't add spells into a campaign thoughtlessly uh, because it can definitely, uh, it can have an adverse effect on a lot of the plans that you have for these investigators when they can cast the spell uh, repeatedly and just sort of, you know, maybe not completely, you know, run through uh, what you have planned, but, you know, may not be as fun as what you were expecting. So, Again, 99% of the time, I do not allow any of my players to start off with an Arcane Tome spell or artifact unless they come to me, and again, uh, there will be limitations. So in the case of Hazel, she doesn't have any. You know, she just came from Georgia to Massachusetts to run a speakeasy. Really did not make sense in her backstory to have any of these uh, three things. Uh, encounters with a Strange Entity is one that I will work with, uh, with an investigator or with a player, um, you know, in for one of my uh, previous uh, campaigns last year, uh, one of the players in, encountered this giant white alligator in the swamp, or this giant alligator in the swamp. Uh, it was a myth. Nobody else believed him. Everyone else said, oh, that's, you know, just an urban legend. But that was a strange entity. Um, and it turned out to play a huge part, you know, later on towards the end of the campaign as it eventually killed him. Um, but, you know, that's, again, something that would work with the players, uh, whether they had the, you know, encounter with the strange entity. And I usually go on the side of uh, that it's mysterious, that they don't necessarily know what they experienced or what they encountered. So in the case of Hazel, as a child in Georgia, she saw something strange in the woods along a river. She cannot remember what it is, but it gave her nightmares for years. So it's this mysterious kind of entity um, that she saw, you know, in the darkness, you know, that gave her this really sort of traumatic feeling as she grew up and grew older into the investigator that she is now. Um, and again, it gives a lot of variability to me as a DM to be able to implement this into a campaign, you know, okay, what, you know, what could this be? You know, it allows me to allow... It allows me to sort of shock my investigators, shock my players, like, oh, you know, this is what this is. Oh, that's, you know, that's not good. So uh, definitely keep this in mind as you're, you know, if you want to have an encounter with a strange uh, entity, just let the DM know. You know, put it in your character sheet, talk with your DM, and, you know, it could lead to something extremely fun and exciting uh, as the campaign goes through. So... Sort of ending off the character sheet, we have the last two boxes, which is going to be the gears and possessions, and then cash and assets. Uh, now, gear and possessions can be found in the uh, the Keeper Handbook, and it is towards the end, as I am sort of looking forward to it, it's towards the end of the, uh, of the handbook, where it has the list of all the items that you can buy, be it guns, hats, clothing, uh, alcohol, food, you know, anything of that nature, you can use your assets or your cash, your spending level to, uh, to buy these things. So with Hazel, she has a spending level of 30 per day, and she decided to buy a fancy hat for $2 because this is 1920s, and a fancy hat isn't going to cost, you know, $100 per item. And with her assets, she has a total of $750 that she would have in a personal bank account. But again, you know, if she wants to buy more than $30, she would need to, you know, run to the bank, you know, withdraw the money, then come back and purchase items, which could take some time uh, in between. And that is up to the keeper's discretion. 
And then uh, you have a quick reference rule underneath gear and possessions. Uh, your levels of success, which kind of basically goes over what I talked about. Uh, wounds and healing, which was a little bit further on uh, from this character sheet, so I didn't go too much into that. Um, and then on the side, we have the fellow investigators, which you would just write down who you are playing with at the table, just to keep track. And as far as the character sheet uh, for Call of Cthulhu, we have made the criminal Hazel that is living in Massachusetts in this Lovecraftian uh, environment. And then the only other thing that we want to just very briefly talk about is when you level up or yes. what the equivalent of leveling up in this is how you deal with improving your character and what all these little check boxes on the skill sheet mean. Yes, that is a very good reminder that I totally did not forget about and was <laughs> waiting until the end to mention this. All right, so yes, as you are playing this campaign, so we just created Hazel and we start off um, in a situation and some policemen start knocking on Hazel's door. And, you know, Hazel comes out and, you know, one of them says, Hey now, we heard that you were running a speakeasy down below this general store. You know, we, we're just coming in to investigate. We want to clear any sort of rumors. You know, obviously Hazel isn't going to let him in. You know, there's, they're obviously investigating this, you know, rumor that may be spreading throughout the street. So she might try to charm them. Uh, and if you look on the skill set or on the character sheet, her charm is 45. So, again, she would roll her percentile dice to determine what she gets. And as I roll, I got a 23. So not quite beating the half value, but definitely succeeding. So Hazel, using her charm, would talk to them and at the end sort of persuade them to, you know, that they don't need to come into this room, you know, or she could let them into the, into the store, but not necessarily show them, you know, any other areas that might lead to her speakeasy. So because she checked or she, she succeeded on this particular skill, uh, she would check mark the box right next to that uh, skill. And at the end of the session, just as we did with the education, uh, with the age at the beginning of our character creation, she's going to roll her percentile dice again. But instead of rolling under the value, she's going to roll her improvement check for the charm value, where she needs to roll above it. So she will need to roll above a 45. And in this case, as I roll, I got a 60. Which means I can now improve my skill by 1d10. So I roll 1d10, and I have 5. So, my, so Hazel's charm skill went up from 45 to now 50, which means she has now a higher chance of succeeding every time she uses this. Now, it's designed this way because as you get higher and higher on these values beside your skill, you have less and less room to succeed. So eventually you get to a point where if you get to, say, like 60 or 70, you know, you're not going to be succeeding your improvement check as much, if at all, ever. Um, and you can do this for all your skills, even skills that you don't have points into as well. Assuming you somehow, you know roll below a 1% or 5%, whatever that may be. I think that's just about it. And we don't have any questions. So it looks like we're just about done. And again, when, with the luck, um, just so that's stressed, if you don't quite, like when she rolled that charm check and her skill was 45, if she had rolled a 46, she could have used a luck point to push it down below, a couple of luck points to push it down below. So that yes, way that is correct. she would be under it. Just to stress that. So don't always think that you're going to give up, you're going to fail everything because you have right. some luck to work with just 
use it wisely. <laughs> yes, and because again, you can run out of luck uh, very quickly, and suddenly you, know, you get to that point where you you know you just need one luck point and you have zero, <laughs> and that could go very very badly in your mm -hmm. situation. Absolutely detrimental. <laughs> very detrimental. Um, so yeah, and again, you know what you have to succeed. Uh, now, of course, you know characters are also going to be rolling an opposed roll, which uh, I'm not really going to get into here. But you know, you obviously know. Okay, I've got to get below 50, 45. You know what you have to get in order to succeed on a check. Mm -hmm. So, which is a very nice thing in Call of Cthulhu. You know, you don't have this arbitrary, you know, invisible number that you know you're not sure exactly, you know, what you're going to have to be. It's right here listed in front of you. And again, un uh, unlike other games, all you have to have is your keeper rule book. That rule book is for the DM, it's for the players, so it's got all of the information you could possibly need in both, and it's just fantastic. It's an absolutely great book. Uh, the people at the company that makes it Chaosium, they did a really good job. I'm very impressed with it. Every single Call of Cthulhu game I've played has been really enjoyable. And I just absolutely, well, they're as enjoyable as a um, horror <laughs> tabletop game can be. Because the last one we played, man, it was stressful. It was a high stress environment. And honestly, it wasn't even necessarily scary. Some it, it was mostly just stress because people use this system in amazing ways. <laughs> I will say that the, every DM I've played with has done a really great job of creating a very interesting environment. Yes, it is a very versatile. Uh, this whole system is just so versatile. You can do anything you want with it. And they have all of the all of these character sheets are completely free on their website. So this is not something that you have to pay for. For the character sheets and they're you can fill them in with any pdf reader pretty much I mean, you don't even have to have adobe acrobat you can use a reader because they're designed to where you can just fill it all in and it'll auto calculate and everything it's it's really wonderful whoever did that at chaosium we love you <laughs> thank you for doing that <laughs> yes thank you so much <laughs> so much you are a absolute hero and a champion so if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and wrap this up here. Thank you so much for coming. Hope this helped. If you have any questions after the fact, or if you're watching this later on YouTube, feel free to join our Discord. If you look down below, you can see information about our Discord and our community. RPHQ's Roleplay Headquarters. We are a roleplay networking hub. We help people find uh, roleplay groups in MMORPGs. We help you find tabletop games. If, if, by God, if we could find a LARPer out there, <laughs> we would help you find a LARPer. Uh, <laughs> any kind of roleplay. We accept them. We love them. We're going to help you find others like you. And we're going to love listening to all your hobbies. We've got a lot of really awesome people there. We have a lot of people who love tabletop who love answering questions and sharing their experiences. So if you've ever been interested in joining Roleplay Headquarters, we would love to have you with us. Javine, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for teaching us how to make these characters. I know it can look very intimidating, but I think you did a great job walking us through it. Well, thank you so much for hosting this. I am definitely glad to help out with creating this uh, system. I love the system, and any time that I can share my knowledge with other people, I will definitely... Uh, I'll definitely take them up on that offer. So thank you so much for having me, and thank you so much, all of you, for uh, listening to this. Awesome. Everyone have a great day, great evening, great week. No matter where you are in the world, no matter what time you're listening to this, I hope that it has been helpful, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.